gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the, the no's prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Fourth Amendment offered by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a two-minute vote. It's another amendment which would transfer money from one section of the bill or department to another. This is Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas with an amendment that would reduce the amount made available for atomic energy defense activities, National Nuclear Security Administration's weapons activities by $10 million and increase that amount in the, uh, for the Corps of Engineers. It's a two-minute vote. It's the last uh, amendment vote for this spending bill, the 2013 Energy and Water Spending Bill. What we expect will happen is the House will move on next to general debate on the 2013 bill for Homeland Security. They'll do that. They'll also do a couple of considerations of motions to instruct conferees on the transportation bill, the highway bill. And if all goes according to uh, tentative plans, we should see some votes sometime in the 4 o'clock hour. More coming up here from the House floor on C-SPAN. and the nays are 260. The amendment is not adopted. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey seek recognition? Madam Chair, I move that the committee now do rise. The question is on the motion that the committee rise. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Accordingly, the committee rises. Madam Chairman. Chairman of the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union reports that the committee has had under consideration H.R. 5325 and has come to no resolution thereon. Mm. Mr. Speaker.
Will members please take their conversations off the floor so the gentleman from Georgia can be heard? What purposes does the gentleman from Georgia rise? Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Rule 22, Clause 7C, I hereby announce my intention to offer a motion to instruct on H.R. 4348. The gentleman may read the form of his motion. Sir? Give me to read the motion. The gentleman may read the motion. Okay. Mr. Brown of Georgia moves that the managers on the part of the House at the conference on the disagreeing of votes of the two houses on the Senate amendment to the bill H.R. 4348 be instructed to insist on provisions that limit funding out of the Highway Trust Fund, including the Mass Transit account for federal aid highway and transit programs to amounts that do not exceed $37 billion $500 million for fiscal year 2013. The gentleman's notice will appear in the record. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What purpose does the gentleman from Alabama seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, uh, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to, re to revise and extend their remarks. Without, ex without objection, so ordered. Pursuant to House Resolution 667 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of H.R. 5855. The Chair appoints the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Roth Latham, to preside over the Committee of the Whole. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the consideration of H.R. 5855, which the Clerk will report by title. A bill making appropriations for the Department of Homeland Security for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2013, and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time. The gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Anderholt, and the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Price, will each control 30 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Alabama. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I yield myself as uh, much time as I may consume. Madam Chairman, the gentleman uh, is recognized. Madam Chair, uh, it was 68 years ago today uh, that uh, more than 9,000 Allied soldiers were killed and wounded during D-Day invasion in Normandy, France. That courageous operation, as well as the sacrifice of so many brave individuals, serves as a sombering reminder that freedom and that security are not free. It is with this solemn commitment to both freedom and security that I respectfully present to the People's House the FY 2013 appropriation bills for the Department of Homeland Security. Similar to our committee's work over the past two fiscal years, this bill demonstrates how we can sufficiently fund vital security programs while also at the same time reduce discretionary spending overall. This bill does not represent a false choice between fiscal responsibility and our nation's security. Both national security priorities are both our national security priorities and both are vigorously addressed in this bill by focused upon four key priorities. Number one, first fiscal discipline. This bill reduces spending below the FY12 enacted level. Second, oversight. This bill continues to strengthen the subcommittee's long bipartisan tradition of strict accountability. Third, support for frontline operation. This bill sustains and it actually even increases operational programs including border and maritime security, immigration enforcement, investigations, targeted aviation security activities, disaster relief, and also cybersecurity. Fourth, preparedness and innovation. Despite the bill's overall reduction in spending, investments in preparedness grants in science and technology are substantially increased above the FY12 levels. In sum, I believe this to be a very strong bill that incorporates considerable input from nearly 200 members, including mem members of the authorizing committees 
and also uh, along with the Appropriations Committee, which meets our nation's pressing needs for both security and for uh, fiscal restraint. I'd like to go into a few details on fiscal discipline and spending that's included in this legislation. The bill before us today provides $39.1 billion in base discretionary funding, which is nearly a half billion dollars below the FY12 enacted level, and it is almost $400 million below the President's own request. There are no earmarks in this bill or the accompanying report. The bill cuts the Department's bureaucratic overhead and headquarters functions by nearly 18 percent below the request and 17 percent below last year's level. Also, the bill substantially reduces the administrative overhead that the Department of Homeland Security component agencies, including $61 million reduction to TSA's administrative functions and a reallocation of TSA's resources to increase privatized screening and canine enforcement teams. In fact, TSA is cut overall by some $422 million below last year's level. As I noted, this bill puts a priority funding on frontline personnel such as Border Patrol, CBP officers, Coast Guard military personnel, and law enforcement agents. It supports the largest immigration detention capacity in the history of ICE, and it sustains high-risk aviation security. It fully funds the known requirements for disaster relief, supports long overdue initiatives in cybersecurity, and robustly supports intelligence, watch listing, threat targeting systems, preparedness grants, and science and technology programs, including the National Agrobiodefense Facility. In addition, this bill reforms the way the Coast Guard acquires its costly operational assets and responsibly funds much-needed cutters and aviation aid assets, those essential tools that will keep our coastline safe and secure our maritime approaches against the plague of illegal drugs. This bill also provides funding where the administration utterly failed. This bill makes up for the $115 million shortfall that was handed to us by the department through a phony unauthorized fee collection as well as a $110 million shortfall resulting, resulting from OMB's failure to properly assess CBP's fee collection. The administration may be able to rely on some of these fee gimmicks in the President's budget, but here uh, in the uh, House and in the subcommittee we do not have that luxury. With respect to oversight, our subcommittee has a bi bipartisan tradition of insisting upon results for each and every taxpayer dollar that it appropriates. Therefore, the bill includes a robust oversight by way of intensified spend plan requirements, reporting requirements, and a full accounting of disaster relief cost, and operational requirements to include border patrol staffing levels and ICE detention capacity. However, I must note that the Department of Homeland Security did an unacceptably poor job at complying with the statutory requirements that were acted in FY12. Those failures are assertively addressed in this bill, and the report through, and, the, and we address this through sizable cuts and withholding to the department. F furthermore, this bill ho holds the administration's feet to the fire when it comes to enforcing our nation's immigration laws. In response to the administration's repeated attempts to water down enforcement, this bill directs ICE to maintain 34,000 detention beds and continues funding for the 287G and worksite enforcement at the, two, at the FY 2012 levels. It is the prerogative of Congress to set such priorities, and I stand by at the direction of this, of, in this bill. Our subcommittee is serious about com compelling the department to not only enforce the law, but to comply with the law as well. And we cannot tolerate further failures in this regard. Finally, on preparedness and innovation, the bill increases preparedness grants by nearly 17 percent and science and technology programs by nearly 24 percent above last year's levels. Committee members and our authorizing members have provided considerable input 
on these programs, and I'm committed to leveraging technology and well-justified investments to sustain our nation's preparedness, as well as spur innovation and foster an environment for job growth. In closing, uh, in my comments uh, this afternoon, I would like to thank Ranking Member uh, David Price. He has been a statesman and a real partner during this process as we have moved this bill forward over the last several months. I do want to thank him for his dedicated professionalism and also his dedicated staff that have acted in a tremendously professional manner and um, their input and contributions that they have made to this bill. Um, let me recognize and thank the members of the Appropriations Committee and also many of the members of the Authorizing Committee uh, for their input and their vital oversight work over the past few months as well as we have moved forward in the producing of this bill. Uh, I'd like to thank the dedicated staff for the Department of Homeland Security that I work with on a day-by-day -day basis as we uh, move this bill forward. Uh, the clerk, uh, Ben Nicholson, uh, Jeff Ashford, uh, Chris Mallard, Kathy Craninger, Miles Taylor, Cornell Teague, and uh, Joe Croce, as well as in my own office, in my personal office who worked on this bill, Brian Rell and Mark Dawson. And of course, on the minority side, Stephanie Gupta, uh, who did a tremendous job in a professional manner uh, on the minority side. Finally, I, I do want to thank the distinguished chairman and the ranking members of the overall Appropriations Committee, uh, Chairman Hal Rogers and ranking member Norm Dix. As much as we had to make difficult choices and trade off at the subcommittee level, I know they had to make much more difficult choices as across all 12 subcommittees. So I sincerely believe, Mr. Uh, chairman, that this bill reflects our best efforts to address our nation's most urgent needs for security and also to address physical discipline. I would urge my colleagues uh, of the, in the House to support this measure, and I would reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman from, gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I uh, rise in support of the bill and yield myself such time as I may utilize. The gentleman's recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased we're considering the fiscal year 2013 Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Bill in a timely fashion and under an open rule. Chairman Adderholt has been collaborative and collegial in the drafting of this bill, and I appreciate his willingness to include input from our side all along the way. I'm generally supportive of the funding levels provided in the bill. The fact remains, however, that our subcommittee was forced to accept a reduced allocation for the Department of Homeland Security when Republicans unilaterally cast aside the spending agreement we reached last August, forcing the Appropriations Committee to absorb $19 billion in reductions below the Budget Control Act levels. Largely because the majority broke that agreement, DHS is funded at 1 percent below the requested level continuing a downward funding trend for this agency over the past few years. The bill does retain the disaster cap adjustment included in the Budget uh, Control Act agreement. Uh, Mr. Chairman, fortunately, despite these circumstances, the bill before us provides adequate funding, I believe, for DHS frontline employees so that they can continue to conduct critical operations along our borders, to protect our nation's airports and seaports, to disrupt the latest plots against the United States and our citizens, and to respond to the spate of natural disasters our country has experienced. I'm also pleased that the bill significantly increases funding for critical grant programs, in marked contrast to the current year's inadequate levels. The bill also rejects the administration's poorly articulated changes to the grant structure, changes that have not been authorized. Specifically, I highlight funding for FEMA state and local grants are $413 million above the fiscal year 2012 level, and both fire grants and emergency management performance grants are funded at the levels requested by the administration. Equally important, the bill provides improved funding for research and development efforts. The bill contains sufficient resources for the Science and Technology Directorate to fund all high-priority research efforts and some new projects as well. 
Unfortunately, while the bill appears to fully fund the administration's request for science and technology, in reality it includes $75 million for construction of the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility in Bath, which the administration did not request, in effect reducing funds for research and development efforts. Now, I support the eventual construction of this facility, but I must question the inclusion of $75 billion in limited resources for a project that the President did not request, that remains under review by two National Academy of Science panels, and that has unobligated prior year appropriations already that it can draw upon. The bill also increases funding for critical Coast Guard as well as Air and Marine acquisitions to recapitalize aging assets while also bringing the latest aviation and vessel technologies online to ensure these personnel can operate more effectively. And finally, the bill includes a substantial increase for cybersecurity protective efforts to continuously monitor and detect intrusions to our federal networks from foreign espionage and cyber attacks. Mr. Chairman, the bill does contain some ill-advised immigration provisions. Unnecessary and wasteful statutory floors are set for a variety of programs, such as an arbitrary minimum of 34,000 detention beds, a required level of spending for the seriously flawed 287G program, and an inflexible amount for worksite enforcement. Including these types of spending floors and mandates in bill language, limits the department's flexibility to respond decisively to immigration challenges and is likely to waste taxpayer dollars for no good reason. I also object to the three abortion general provisions that were added in full committee. Now, we all know, Mr. Chairman, abortion is a politically charged subject. Numerous restrictions in law have already conditioned and qualified reproductive freedom in practice. Among those are prohibitions on the use of federal funds for abortion procedures, which are specifically applied to Immigration and Customs Enforcement and the Department of Homeland Security by the President's Executive Order 13535, issued on March 24, 2010. Until now, our bill has never touched on the topic of abortion because it's not relevant to the Department of Homeland Security and it falls far outside the lines of jurisdiction of this subcommittee. So these provisions are redundant, they will accomplish nothing, they make no change whatsoever in current law or procedures. They seem designed mainly for political effect, but I tell you, political effect cuts both ways. These abortion riders, while unnecessary, are inflammatory, they're divisive, they should not be included in the final bill. Finally, I also strongly disagree with provisions that withhold the following, 60% of all funding provided to the Secretary, Undersecretary, Chief Financial Officer, 10% of all funding for salaries and expenses at uh, Customs and Border uh, Protection personnel, about 37% for Coast Guard Headquarters Directorate, until they submit numerous reports required by statute. <coughs> Even more egregiously, these withholdings are coupled with a provision that prevents the Secretary, the Deputy Secretary, the Commandant of our Coast Guard, and the Vice Commandant from using their aircraft, from using their aircraft, until certain key reports are received by the committee. These constraints are excessive. They will prevent Department employees, Coast Guard leadership, from effectively doing their jobs. I support efforts to hold the Department accountable, and in fact, we included carefully calibrated and targeted withholdings in this bill when I was chairman. But excessive and unrealistic limitations uh, frankly detract from this subcommittee's credibility, and they're likely to be counterproductive. Mr. Chairman, I will close by thanking the hardworking professional staff which has helped craft this bill and has assisted the subcommittee in a bipartisan manner over the course of the year. Uh, I also want to thank, uh, as the chairman did, Ben Nicholson, Kathy Craninger, Jeff Ashford, Chris Mallard, Joe Kroos, Miles Taylor, and Cornell Teague on the majority side, and of course, Stephanie Gupta on our side of the aisle, Justin Ween from my office. And I want to reiterate my appreciation to the chairman for his efforts to work with us on so many issues and to sustain our frontline 
federal homeland security operations. With that, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. General, gentleman from Alabama is recognized. Oh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I would like to yield uh, five minutes to the uh, chairman of the full appropriations committee, uh, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Rogers. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Adderholt, for yielding the time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is the uh, tenth anniversary bill for this subcommittee. Uh, we began work in 2003, uh, and the first three speakers that are on the platform today are the three chairmen of that subcommittee in its ten years of history. Uh, I had the honor of being the first chairman, and then was followed by David Price uh, as chairman, and now Robert uh, Adderholt. So uh, we have, if there is any accumulated wisdom, we possess a, a portion of it. Uh, so uh, we want to thank uh, Chairman Adderholt and Ranking Member Price for their hard work on this uh, subcommittee. This is truly a bipartisan, nonpartisan subcommittee uh, because the nation's security cannot uh, bow to uh, 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 any partisan uh, spirits. But I think after these 10 years, we can all agree that the country is indeed safer than it was then. Uh, we've thwarted, uh, the country's thwarted several attempts at terrorist attacks in our skies. Uh, we've eliminated the world's most heinous terrorist, Osama bin Laden, and more recently, uh, the number two uh, Al Qaeda leader uh, in Afghanistan, Pakistan. But we face constant reminders that the war on terror is anything uh, near over. Our freedom is not free, and we can't skimp on our national security if we want to stay vigilant and, most importantly, safe. Discretionary uh, funding in this bill totals just over $39 billion, which indeed is a cut of $483 million below last year. Uh, and $393 million below what the President requested. Uh, the Chairman, uh, Adderholt, and his subcommittee uh, drafted this bill with four priorities in mind. One, putting security first. Second, encouraging strong fiscal discipline. Three, mandating robust oversight efforts. And four, boosting the research and grant programs that support American jobs, innovation, and preparedness. To support and address vital frontline operations, the bill makes smart increases or holds constant programs that enhance intelligence, uh, threat targeting, or that act is as the first line of defense and response. This includes providing funding for the largest immigration detention capacity and Border Patrol agents in history. But at the end of the day, the bill totals less than it did last year, and that's because of thoughtful, responsible reductions. Our limited government resources must be put towards programs and services with proven benefits and tangible results. These cuts targeted programs with known inefficiencies, program delays, excessive overhead costs, or those that simply had lower budget requirements. The bill also rescinds excess or unspent prior year funds. Now, as the Department enters its 10th anniversary, we are reminded that the Department in its current form is still, quote, under construction, end of quote. Though we've seen some real progress made, DHS can still improve the way it spends taxpayer dollars and administers its grant programs. This legislation, I think, takes the right steps to direct spending accordingly, enacting reforms, requiring tougher oversight, and demanding justifications and spending plans from programs that do not have a history of wise spending decisions. Again, I want to thank uh, Chairman Adderholt, Ranking Member Price, all of the members of the subcommittee, 
and the hardworking staff uh, for all the many hours that they've spent drafting this important bill. Uh, but this legislation is proof that we can do more with less. A reduction in spending coupled with reforms to encourage efficiency and sustainability that will help us get on a stronger fiscal path. I believe this is a good bill, Mr. Chairman. It's as good a bill as I've seen in my 10 years on this subcommittee. And I want to, again, congratulate those who had a hand in making it uh, possible. So I urge my colleagues to vote yes on this bill to help prevent future terrorist attacks, to protect air passengers, and to keep our borders secure. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Alabama reserves. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I uh, would like to yield three minutes to an outstanding member of our subcommittee, the uh, gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Lowy. Gentlewoman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank Chairman Adderholt and Ranking Member Price for their bipartisan work on this legislation. The fiscal year 2013 Homeland Security Appropriations Bill would make smart investments in our national security infrastructure, including increasing funds for cybersecurity, focusing Homeland Security dollars at communities most at threat of terror attacks, and providing our first responders with the resources to protect us. With limited resources, we must prioritize assistance to the regions most likely to be attacked. That is why I'm so pleased that this bill takes a step toward restoring the original intent of the Urban Area Security Initiative by focusing resources on the 25 most at-risk cities while still providing funding for other regions through other programs. Ten years after 9-11, the threat of radiological attack and New York's status as the number one terror target remain. That is why I'm so pleased that this bill would maintain $22 million to support securing the cities, which seeks to prevent the smuggling of illicit nuclear material into Manhattan. I'm also pleased that assistance to firefighter and safer grants would be adequately funded. As local governments have faced difficult budget decisions, firefighters have been laid off, leaving our neighborhoods with inadequate protection. This legislation would fund firefighter hiring grants and extend the safer waiver to allow communities to retain or rehire laid off firefighters. I'm extremely disappointed, however, that Republicans needlessly injected divisive social issues into the bill. I've served on this subcommittee or the authorizing committee for nearly a decade. In that time, I've met with the first responders, ICE agents, Border Patrol, and many other security personnel. Not once have they said that women's reproductive health makes our country less secure. Not once. And weighing down this bill with ideological riders is a disservice to all first responders. In closing, again, I would like to thank the committee for its investments in Homeland Security and first responders and hope that this legislation will not be used as a vehicle for ideological policy riders on the floor. And I yield back my time. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from North Carolina Reserves. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, at this time I'd like to uh, recognize the chairman of the uh, Homeland Security Authorizing Committee, uh, Mr. Peter King, uh, for three minutes. The gentleman from New York is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Chairman, I uh, thank the chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee for yielding. Let me at the very outset <clears throat> thank him for his leadership and cooperation in working through such a difficult bill at such a difficult time in our history. We are faced with a severe terrorist threat. We are also faced with severe fiscal restraints. Last year I very reluctantly voted against the uh, Homeland Security Appropriations Bill, but I want to commend Chairman Rogers and Chairman Adderholt 
for working to resolve the good faith differences we had and also, for instance, in uh, areas such as state and local grants to increase them by $350 million, to increase by 50 percent the amount allocated to the highest risk areas in our country. Uh, programs such as the Urban, Urban Area Security Initiative, the State Homeland Security Grant Program, Port Security, Transportation Security, all those were addressed in this bill. Nothing is ever as much as we want, but considering the realities we face as a nation, uh, Chairman Rogers and Chairman Adderholt have done an outstanding job. Coming from a district which uh, lost so many people on September 11th and which still faces threats and where we uh, every day, quite frankly, analyzing terror threat reports, I, uh, this uh, funding is extremely important, especially to the NYPD, which does such an outstanding job in spite of the gratuitous, mindless, shameless attacks made upon it by those in the media and by others in elected office as well. So this funding is extremely, extremely vital. Also, especially for the, C, uh, the, uh, the STC to secure the city's program, which will protect not just New York, but uh, provide a template to protect urban areas against uh, dirty bomb attacks throughout the country. Also, let me uh, focus on the issue of the TWIC program, and I know the ranking member from the Homeland Security Committee is here, and he'll be addressing this later. But this is an issue of bipartisan concern to our committee, the fact that uh, this, we still have not been able to perfect the uh, TWIC system, and there's been burdens imposed on our workers as far as uh, time constraints imposed on them, as far as funding they have to spend, and this is a real burden that's been on them. Today in the uh, uh, Homeland Security uh, Committee, we passed by voice vote the Smart Port Bill, which attempts to alleviate this burden on the port worker. Primarily what it does is it extends the validity of the TWIC cards currently set to begin expiring later this year until the Department of Homeland Security finally releases the TWIC reader rule. Port workers, truck drivers, and others who have to obtain a TWIC should not have to bear the burden of the government's inability to get the job done. I believe the provision we included in this uh, smart port bill provides sufficient motivation for Coast Guard and CSA. I can assure you on behalf of myself, I know he can speak for himself, but the ranking member of the committee as well, we will work together. Our committee will work and work with the Appropriations Committee and with the Department as we try to resolve this issue. So again, I thank uh, Chairman Adderholt for his leadership, for the job that he has done, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Alabama reserves. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I would like to yield three minutes to a leading member of our full Appropriations Committee, uh, uh, Ms. Kaptur. I would lady, like to. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. I would like to thank Ranking Member Price for yielding us this time, as well as Chairman Adderholt and full committee chairman Rogers for their work on this legislation and for accepting and including the Buy American language that we had worked so very hard and requested. The Department of Homeland Security needs to raise its consciousness about the importance of buying American and its relationship to jobs in America. Our language further clarifies what has long been the intent of Congress that the Department of Homeland Security must comply with the Berry Amendment and buy U.S.-made products. This is an essential provision for the American economy and our manufacturers. Congress has already voted to explicitly direct the Department of Homeland Security to comply with the Berry Amendment. And the Department of Homeland Security is either muscle-bound or been dragging its feet, but somehow they're not hearing us for some odd reason. Also, the Department of Homeland Security's Authorizing Committee unanimously adopted an amendment that would ensure permanent compliance. The Department of Homeland Security, uh, one of the largest departments in our government, should be the leader in homeland security, starting with strengthening American procurement. Can you imagine what they procure in a year? Well, I know they buy a lot of U.S.-made flags, uh, or at least they should, uh, but vessels, uh, our Coast Guard's full array of equipment, security systems, weapons, uniforms, the list goes on and on. So why wouldn't they make an effort to do what Congress directed? I would like to also acknowledge the fine work of the gentleman from North Carolina, Congressman Larry Kissel, for his consistent 
leadership on this issue of buying American. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, Representative Kathy Hochul, who in her first term has been a steadfast leader for buying American as essential for U.S. job creation. I want to thank the full committee for their commitment to this issue, and we would like to invite the Department of Homeland Security to the American table. Let's follow suit with the Department of Defense and the other major departments of our government. Let's buy American and help to contribute to procurement of goods and services made right here in the USA. It's the best investment that we can make in the future. Um, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I would like to uh, yield my remaining time uh, to the ranking member, and I thank them so very much, along with Mr. Adderholt, for including this language in the bill. Let us hope the Department of Homeland Security is listening and pays attention to the law. Gentlelady yields back. Gentleman from North Carolina Reserves. Gentleman from Alabama is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I would like to recognize the uh, hardworking uh, chairman of the Energy and Water Subcommittee, who has also been on the floor this week with uh, that le his legislation, uh, Mr. Friedlenheisen, for two minutes. Gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank the chairman for yielding, and I rise in support of the Homeland Security Appropriations Bill. Our nation lives with the memory of September 11, 2001, each and every day. We can never take back the events of that day, nor the thousands of lives, including 700 from New Jersey, that were lost. Like Mr. King, I'd like to highlight that this legislation includes critical funding for investments in first responder grants. The bill includes $1.7 billion for departments, state and local grant program, which include the Homeland Security Grant Pro Program and what we call UWASI, Urban Area Security Initiative, both of which have been greatly benefiting New Jersey and the New York metropolitan area for the last 10 years. The bill also includes $650 million in firefighter grants and $350 million for emergency management performance grants. It's important to note that this bill, again, includes, due to the leadership of the chairman, language to improve accountability and transparency to ensure the taxpayers' dollars are well spent. And lastly, I think all of us would like to recognize how much we depend on the hard work and dedication, tireless work, of so many homeland security pro professionals, emergency squad, fire and police that do the job and some of whom have paid the ultimate sacrifice. I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. Gentleman from Alabama Reserves. Gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I am uh, privileged to yield two minutes to the uh, outstanding uh, ranking member of the authorizing committer, committee, uh, Mr. Thompson. Gentleman from Mississippi is recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman from North Carolina for allowing me the time. I have a number of thoughts on the underlying bill uh, before us today, but I'd like to take the opportunity to discuss the Transportation Worker Identification Credential Program, the TWIC program. Earlier today, uh, the authorizing committee on a bipartisan basis approved language modeled after a bill I introduced, H.R. 1105, to prevent current TWIC holders the men and women who work in our ports from being forced by TSA to pay for new identification cards beginning in October of this year, given the program is not fully implemented and the department has not even issued a rule for biometric readers. The TWIC program is focused on protecting the nation's maritime transportation facilities and vessels by requiring maritime workers and other workers who need unescorted access to secure port facilities to obtain a biometric identification card. After initial delays, all maritime workers were required to obtain biometric TWIC cards by April 2009. The cost to workers for these cards is $132.50 per credentials. To date, over 2.1 million longshoremen, truckers, merchant marinas, at rail and vessel crew members have undergone extensive homeland security and criminal background checks to secure TWICs. Even as workers raced in the spring of 2009 to obtain TWICs to continue working in our nation's port, TSA has more than two years late 
in starting the reader pilots. Uh, our committee has been told that even under the best circumstances, found regulations are not likely to be issued until late 2014, more than five years beyond the date required in statute. Yet Congress or the administration act starting October 2012, workers will have to renew the cards they were issued. Uh, additional 30 seconds. I yield the gentleman an additional minute, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized for an additional minute. Thank you very minute. much, uh, uh, Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, the point I'd like to make, uh, Mr. Speaker, is that 2.1 million workers have TWIC cards. Through no fault of their own, they will be required to renew those cards unless we act. Uh, I appreciate uh, this legislation acknowledging that we have to do something for those workers or through no fault of their own. They'll have to renew a card, which is at this point, uh, at best, a flash card. Uh, it's not really a worker identification card. With that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the time. Chairman yields back. Gentleman from North Carolina Reserves. Gentleman from Alabama is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman uh, from Iowa, Mr. Latham, who is the uh, chairman of the Transportation and Housing and Urban Development Subcommittee of Appropriation for two minutes. Gentleman from Iowa is recognized for two minutes. I, I thank the, uh, the chairman and uh, uh, Chairman Adderholt. Thank you very much for the time. Uh, I rise in strong support of H.R. 5855, the Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Act for fiscal year 2013, and I commend the chairman and the ranking member and the staff uh, for doing a really excellent job of crafting a bill uh, that both strengthens our security and reduces government spending. I'm pleased the committee adopted an important amendment which I co-sponsored uh, which would waive federal grant requirements to allow the retention of firefighters hired in our local communities. This is a critically important provision for maintaining response capabilities throughout the nation. I also want to highlight the fact that despite spending reductions elsewhere in the bill, we were fully funding FEMA's stated requirements for disaster relief, including flood-related grants. Congress has long recognized the federal role in disaster relief and prevention efforts uh, since the first disaster relief bill was passed in 1803. The funding contained in the bill today is important because it continues the move away from ad hoc disaster legislation and toward including relief and mitigation funding uh, in our regular appropriations. This assistance is vitally important uh, for the safety net for communities at risk for natural disasters. Throughout the summer of 2011, I saw firsthand the, the flood damage along the Missouri River in western and southwestern Iowa and spoke with Iowans whose lives are disrupted by that disaster. The flood dealt serious damage to properties along the river and took a breathtaking toll of near, nearby communities. Hazard mitigation and other disaster assistance funding is absolutely necessary to help them rebound from this tragic flooding. Uh, with that, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I would uh, urge all members of the House to support final passage of this H.R. 5855, uh, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Alabama Reserves. That was just perfect. The gentleman from North Carolina. <laughs> Chairman, I reserve. Gentleman reserve, gentleman from Alabama is recognized. Yeah, at this time I would like to recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Labiando, who is the chairman of the subcommittee on the Coast Guard uh, Authorizing Com Subcommittee, and I'd like to recognize him for one minute. Gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for um, one minute. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I rise today in very strong support of H.R. 5855. Earlier this year, the President requested to cut funding for the Coast Guard more than 4 percent below the current level. This was the first time in over a decade that a President has proposed to reduce funding for the Coast Guard. In his budget, the President proposed to slash the number of service members by more than 1,000, which would shutter recruiting stations, take recently upgraded helicopters out of service, and uh, exacerbate the growing patrol boat mission hour gap by retiring vessels before their replacements arrive. For acquisition, the President proposed to slash the budget by more than $270 million, or 19 percent below the FY 2012 enacted level. 
The request proposed to terminate or delay the acquisition of severe, several critically needed replacement assets and eliminate funding to renovate derelict housing for service members and their dependents. The cuts put forth by the Obama administration were simply unacceptable and myself and I think a large number of members were gravely concerned. As chairman of the Coast Guard's authorizing subcommittee, I know how critical it is for us not to repeat the mistakes of the 1990s when misguided cuts to the services operation and acquisitions budget left it entirely unprepared to meet the uh, post-9-11 mission demand. Fortunately, the bill before us today rejects the uh, draconian cut. 30 seconds, please. The gentleman is recognized 30 additional seconds. Fortunately, the bill before us today rejects the draconian cuts proposed by the President and ensures the Coast Guard is provided with the resources needed to carry out its critical missions. I want to especially like to thank uh, Chairman Adderholt and Ranking Member Price and their entire staff for recognizing the critical mission needs of the Coast Guard and accommodating those needs for the protection of America. I urge all members to support the legislation. Thank you. The gentleman from Alabama reserves. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I reserve the balance. The gentleman continues to reserve. The gentleman from Alabama. At this time, I would like to recognize the uh, vice chairman of our uh, subcommittee on Homeland Security, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Carter, for one minute. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in strong support of H.R. 5855. The, the, 2013, the 2013 Homeland Security Appropriations Measure. As a member of the Homeland Security Appropriations Subcommittee, I believe that under the leadership of Chairman Adderholtz, we have exercised the much-needed oversight that the department, through the, of, the, to, of the department through the course of these, this year's hearings. And this bill, along with the accompanying report, continue to ensure Congress is kept informed of how the valuable taxpayer dollars will be spent at, by requiring numerous reports and briefings from DHS. This bill funds frontline security operations at their highest level in history, ensuring that our Border Patrol agents and ICE officers have the resources they need to secure our borders. I'm also pleased that this bill contains language that will improve awareness and cooperation between federal agents and non-governmental organizations to help combat the heinous crime of human trafficking also known as modern-day slavery. Again, I urge my colleagues to support this critical measure, and I yield back the balance of my time. The yields back. The gentleman from Alabama reserves. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I reserve. The gentleman continues to reserve. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, a hardworking member of our uh, subcommittee on Homeland Security, Mr. Dent, for one and a half minutes. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for one and a half minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of the uh, Department of Homeland Security Act for 2013, and I want to thank the uh, Chairman Adderholt and Ranking Member Price for their leadership of this subcommittee. Uh, H.R. 5855 is a fiscally responsible measure, and it totals $39 billion in discretionary funding for DHS, uh, a decrease of about $484 million below current levels. Uh, the bill takes a scalpel to agencies, ensuring adequate funding is available to meet program objectives while weeding out unnecessary spending. I want to take a moment to highlight uh, a few of the critical aspects of this bill. First, our first responders, uh, we provide $2.8 billion uh, for FEMA first responder grants. Additionally, uh, the assistance to fire grants and uh, emergency management performance grants will receive $670 million equal to the President's request. Uh, furthermore, I'm pleased to uh, note an amendment offered by uh, Mr. Price, Ms. Lowy, uh, Mr. Latham, and I uh, during the full committee markup to foster further flexibility for local departments in utilizing fire grants, uh, the funds that are, that are adopted in this measure. So as for border protection, uh, the bill contains $10.2 billion for uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, supporting the largest totals of CBP border agents and officers in history. Uh, similarly, the uh, U.S. Customs Immigration Enforcement received $5.5 billion, uh, supporting initiatives like the Visa Security Program, as well as 34,000 um, ICE uh, detention bed, bed spaces, our highest capacity to date. Uh, these are just a few of the provisions in the bill I want to touch on this afternoon. Uh, H.R. 5855 has been crafted as a smart and fiscally responsible uh, funding bill for the Department of Homeland Security. I encourage my colleagues to support passage. Also, just want to commend the leadership of uh, uh, Chairman Rogers and Ranking Member Dix for their leadership on this measure as well. 
It's time I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Alabama reserves. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Chairman, I reserve. The gentleman continues to reserve. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize my colleague from Alabama, Mr. Rogers, who is the uh, subcommittee chairman on the uh, authorizing Homeland Security Committee on and for the chairing the Transportation Security uh, Subcommittee. And I'd like to uh, he be recognized for a minute and a half. Mr. Rogers of Alabama is recognized for one and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in strong support of this bill and urge all my colleagues to vote for it. And I also want to congratulate my friend and colleague from Alabama, Chairman Adder Hope, for all his hard work on this bill. He's shown the American people how to craft a bill that is strong on homeland security, helps protect us from terrorist attacks, funds vital programs, and grants. And it does so in a fiscally responsible manner by spending almost $500 million less than last year. The bill helps protect our borders and prioritizes funding for immigration enforcement. It provides critical grant funding for our first responders, our heroes on the front line of attack or disaster. For transportation security, the bill takes on TSA's bureaucratic mess. It cuts $61 million from TSA managerial overhead. It caps full-time screening personnel at 46,000, and it emphasizes the private sector's role in airport security screening operations. Importantly, it does not increase any fees that would fall on the trend public, which would threaten jobs in the aviation industry. I know firsthand of Chairman Adderholt's dedication and leadership on these issues. I also know of his commitment to reducing wasteful spending and restoring fiscal sanity in Washington. And again, I commend my friend and colleague from Alabama and his fine staff on their hard work and dedication. I urge all my colleagues to vote for the bill. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Alabama reserves. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Mr. Chairman, does, uh, does the majority have any more speakers? <coughs> does the majority have more speakers? Uh, we are finished with our speakers at this time. All right. Then, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I will uh, conclude by, uh, again, uh, commending uh, the chairman and uh, our whole subcommittee. We have a good subcommittee, a good uh, active group of members, and uh, virtually all had uh, positive input into this legislation. I appreciate the spirit in which the uh, chairman has, has uh, made an honest effort to accommodate uh, constructive input from all, uh, all sources. Uh, there's um, much to commend about this bill, starting with the support of frontline operations, but also some improvements from the funding situation we're looking at this year with respect to state and local uh, FEMA grants, for example, and with respect to science and technology uh, uh, operations. Uh, there are uh, funding shortfalls in this bill with respect to the headquarters needs at St. Elizabeth's, with respect to certain uh, uh, administrative needs of, of, of the department, and others that we could name. But under the constraints of, uh, of the uh, budget allocation, uh, there um, is, is a good balance in this bill, I think, and, and one that uh, we ha has, uh, has required a, a great deal of accommodation and a great deal of hard work. Uh, I've already said that I think there's some extraneous elements to this bill that are not so constructive. The uh, immigration provisions, the abortion provisions, and some excessive uh, withholding uh, provisions. I sincerely hope that in the debate to come that we will not uh, compound that problem. We know we're going to be dealing with uh, dozens of amendments. We're going to be dealing with uh, additional uh, rider proposals, uh, ill-advised uh, for the most part. We're going to be dealing with uh, perhaps some tempting uh, spending provisions that will, uh, will cannibalize those uh, front office uh, uh, expenses or the science and technology expenses or other accounts in this, uh, in this bill for the sake of amendments that may sound good but really uh, will, will upset, could upset. Uh, some of the delicate balances that this bill has struck. So we're going to have, a, I, I hope and believe, a uh, probably lengthy uh, and also constructive uh, process of discussion and amendment under the, under the open rule. And I very much hope, uh, hope that the uh, end result of that process will be a, a bill that can, uh, can claim uh, broad support. So uh, we're going to have a few hours of uh, uh, until that uh, process begins, but with the, with the chairman, I look forward to uh, getting on with this and uh, at the end of the week having a, a Homeland Security Appropriations Bill. With that, I yield the balance of my time.
and yields back his time. Gentleman from Alabama is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier in my opening comments, I do believe this bill is a good bill. It reflects our best efforts to try to address our nation's most urgent needs. And of course, first of all, security, and second of all, uh, physical discipline. Both of those are very important in this uh, age in which we live. So I would urge my colleagues to support this measure as it uh, moves to the floor. Uh, at this time, I would yield back the remainder of uh, the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. All time for general debate has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from